Good morning, Hill family. I want to ask you to, to stand for the reading of God's word as we begin our time of worship this morning. I'm going to be reading uh, from Psalm 20. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all of your plans. May he shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Psalm 20 is a, is a psalm of assurance. Uh, David declares in verse 6, I'll read it to you again. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Um, he will answer him from his holy heaven. I want to remind us this morning as we begin our a worship service that we too stand on such promises as David. And like David, our assurance rests not in the powers of man, not in horses or chariots, but in the name of the Lord our God. And we stand in the assurance which rests in Christ and Christ alone, which we know as New Testament believers. So I want to invite you this morning to sing. Uh, to maybe stand if you would like to in your home, but to sing with us that we, that we too might rise and stand upright in Christ this morning. So would you sing with us? We won't move 
God, we thank you that you're a God who's never changing, who is faithful when we are faithless. God. We thank you that you are sovereign, that you're a promise maker and a promise keeper. And Father, in this season when we're it's filled with so much uh, uncertainty, fear, uh, even chaos. Lord, we pray that you help us to be able to say it is well with my soul that despite what we're facing, the challenges, the struggles, that we'll be able to say it as well because we have you. Because Jesus took our sin and nailed it upon that cross. And that we have life. We have freedom. We can be joyful. Because you not only died for us, but you rose and you conquered death. And so, Father, as we continue to worship, I pray that you'll help us to keep this in mind. That we'll be able to sing with all our hearts, with all our minds, with everything that we have it is well with my soul. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll what i 
family and friends. My name is Elliot and we are so glad you chose to worship with us. We think there are a few announcements you should know about. Hey Hill City kids, our Zoom Sunday school meetings are rolling. If you are in lower elementary, upper elementary, or in middle school, we encourage you to come and enjoy time of fellowship and worship with your friends. It starts at 9 o'clock and ends at 9.50 every Sunday before service. We will email a link, but if for any reason you do not receive it, please let Pastor Bob know. I can't wait to see you there. In addition, middle schoolers, we invite you to join us on Zoom every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. for fellowship and games with your peers. Our virtual corporate prayer meetings continue today at 4 p.m. Please join us as we gather together to pray as a body. Please refer to your email for an access link to join. We're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. We love you and we long for the day that we get to worship together and in person. Good morning, Hill family. It is good to be here. Um, and it is good to get for us to gather together in prayer. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts uh, for the hearing of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, it is well with my soul, um, with all of our souls, to call you Father and to know that is who you are. And that is only because of the work of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us upon the cross. He paid a price that we could not pay. He paid the price in full for our sins so that we would be forgiven and our debts would be taken away. And because of this, we have access to you as Father. And Father, you are King of Kings. And today we want to reflect upon that. And Jesus Christ, you are Lord of all. You are our creator. You are the maker of all things. You spoke the universe into existence. And the power of your word is what holds all things together. And when you walked upon the earth, you showed us your authority your authority over creation itself, over the land and sea, even being able to calm the storm with a single word of be silent, be still. 
you showed your power and authority over the demons by casting them out and telling them to be silent. You showed your authority and power over hunger by taking a small boy's lunch and feeding over 5,000. You showed your loving, tender care and authority over sickness as you touched us who were unclean and made us clean and cleansed us of all our diseases and sickness. You are sovereign over all. But Lord Jesus, we confess that there are times when we forget this willfully and sometimes forgetfully, but we forget that you are sovereign and we choose to sin. We choose to do what is right in our own eyes. We choose to advance our own kingdom rather than yours. We dishonor you with our thoughts, with our actions, and with our words. Father, we ask for forgiveness for this. And dear Jesus, we ask that you would just continue to call us back to yourselves. And Father, I pray for those that um, might be looking at life and saying they have too much to lose to bow the knee to Lord Jesus. Father, I, would, I pray that you would convict them through your Holy Spirit of how false that is, how much they have to lose that they cannot hold on to, and how much they have to gain that they cannot buy. And Father, I pray for those of us that do know you, that forget how good and mighty and sweet a savior we have, who is our king, and who has the words of life, where else shall we go, where else shall we follow? So Father, um, we just ask today for a new revelation of yourself through your word that we would draw near to you and see you like we've never seen you before and understand, Lord, how to navigate the world in which we live. We thank you, Father, that you did send your son. We thank you for the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our minds and softening our hearts so that we can see Christ for who he is, both Lord and Savior and God of all. Father, we, we ask today, um, we lift up our leaders, Lord, those in places of, of government, Lord, um, as we navigate through these uncertain times um, amid COVID-19 and the quarantine, Lord. Um, we confess that we are dependent upon you. We confess that our, our leaders, um, in some ways are put in an impossible situation of knowing what to do in, un, in these uncertain times. Lord, we know that there are health concerns. We know that there are economic concerns. We know that there's also um, a lot of stress on mental health and just um, people um, not knowing what to do next and also being forced in environments that they're not used to being in and, in and having to endure. So Lord, we, we pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom above and beyond themselves to make decisions that are not political but are what is best and what honors you. And Father, too, I pray for our, our leaders, too, that um, during this season, that this might be um, an event that would bring some to know you, that they would truly see how dependent we are on you, God, and how much we do need a Savior. And Although we so often try to live lives on our own, we are quite incapable of doing that well. 
Father, um, have mercy upon us all. And Father, I thank you that there is hope in Jesus, that he is our hope. He is the, your final revelation. He is the Savior of the world, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is coming back. Help us, Lord, to live in step with that. Help us, Lord, to be able to navigate both the God-given authorities that rule over us and also the ultimate authority of you, Lord Jesus. Help us to honor you with our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, church. If you have a Bible, uh, please open it to the Gospel of Mark. We'll be continuing on in our study, and we'll be in uh, the second half of chapter 12 this morning. Mark chapter 12 is where we'll be. Now, on August uh, 24, uh, 410, the city of Rome was sacked by a, really a ruthless band of Visigoths led by King Alaric. Uh, for the Romans, this, this devastating event demanded some sort of interpretation. Why had the mighty empire of Rome fallen? What exactly had went wrong? And Roman minds began to speculate uh, that Christianity was at fault. Uh, they believe that Constantine's adopting of Christianity a century before, leading to the dismantling of the Roman gods, had, had led to their demise. They they believed that because Rome had forsaken their divine narrative as they saw it and adopted the narrative of the Hebrews, the gods brought judgment. Uh, and when this argument came to the attention of the bishop and great theologian of North Africa, uh, St. Augustine as we know him, he responded by writing a thousand page letter known today as the city of God. Within, Augustine uh, set the story of Rome, both its rising and its falling within the context of biblical history. Rome was simply a player on God's great stage of redemptive history, Augustine argued. But at the center of Augustine's response or this letter was his two-city argument, as has been called. Augustine argued that all human history can be divided into two cities, the city of man and the city of God which he finds and really traces throughout the Bible, beginning in the earliest chapters of Genesis. And very importantly, Augustine argued that we, Christians, we find ourselves simultaneously as citizens of both cities. We are currently citizens of the city of man, and we are currently citizens of the city of God, if we know Christ. Therefore, our, our calling as the people of God, as the church, is to live as citizens of God's city while currently occupying residency in this city of man. Now, while Augustine's writings are important to us as Christians, Jesus' words are essential. So this morning, our, our text contains one of the Another one of Jesus' very famous sayings, which speaks to this very issue. And really, I think due to its popularity, there's a danger with this passage uh, in that we oftentimes tend to run past passages like this too quickly and really miss the depth of what's actually being said in the text. So I want to ask you this morning before we get into this famous passage, maybe you want to reflect for a moment, but do you believe the Bible has any vision for for the state? Does the Bible help us in any way think through our relationship as Christians to uh, the governing authorities, the government? Our passage this morning is found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which points to its significance and its importance. And here's what I think we need to learn from this passage, which will help us think through the question. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to be good citizens on this earth while giving full allegiance to King Jesus alone. So as the church of Jesus Christ, our, our calling is to be good citizens on this earth while giving 
full allegiance to King Jesus alone. I'm going to pick up in chapter 13 of, uh, in, in, in verse 13 of chapter 12 in Mark's gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly speak the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay taxes then to them or should we not? But, but knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now we're in Jesus' passion week of Mark's gospel, or the final week of uh, Jesus' life here on earth. And it's the time of the Passover. It's Israel's national week-long celebration. It was a, a, a great time to be a, a temple merchant in Jerusalem this week. Thousands upon thousands of people would enter the city every day this week to make sacrifices for worship. And it's during this time that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to begin this week. And after entering the city, Jesus immediately paid a visit to the temple and had a look around. The following day, he would return to denounce what was taking place in the temple. And then he, uh, he was confronted by the religious leaders regarding, very importantly, his authority. On the following day, Tuesday, Jesus confronts these same religious leaders by telling them a parable concerning themselves, which we addressed last week. He prophesied concerning their rejection of him, which would lead to God's judgment. But these religious leaders, they will have no part of this. They, they sought to arrest Jesus, but the text says due to the crowds, they dismissed them. However, we know that their, their plotting uh, continued and even intensified. So later that day, they strategically sent an unlikely group to, to, to come to Jesus with a question to try and derail his mission, which is where we pick up this morning. But before we get to Jesus' famous answer, we need to really understand the context to which this question and answer arises out of. And to do that, I think we want to first, I want you to look at the, the deep deception that we find in verses 13 and really in 14 as well. In verse 13, we read, And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. Now it's been said, maybe you've heard it, that love and hatred are two, two really of the strongest forces which bring people together. While, of course, love is preferred, we sadly know the second to be true and even evident here in our text. You would be hard-pressed to find two groups uh, more opposed and more hating each other than the Pharisees and the Herodians. They could not oppose one another more. The the Pharisees were, were right-wing, really, fanatics. The Herodians were left-wing liberals, you could say. The Pharisees were pro-Jewish and wanted no part of the Romans. The Herodians were the servants of Herod, the, the puppet Roman king assigned to be uh, on the throne. So these two groups wouldn't be caught doing anything together. They couldn't agree on anything except their hatred of Jesus. The, the Pharisees hate Jesus because he is disrupting their religious agenda. The Herodians hate Jesus because he's threatening their political agenda. Hatred of the Son of God is the glue which binds these two unlikely groups together. And the, and the unlikely nature of this union really does speak to the depth of this deception. And the first few words of verse 13 makes clear who is behind all of this. Look at it, verse 13. The, the they of 13 takes us back to the they of verse 12, referring to the religious leaders from last week's parable. It's the religious leaders who sent this unlikely duo to Jesus, and their intent is clear. 
they were sent to trap him in his talk. And notice how slithery this deception is in verse 14. Verse 14, and they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Really, wicked flattery rolls off the tongues of these guys. The the truth of Proverbs 26, verse 23 comes to mind. A lying tongue hates its victim, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Now, ironically, they refer to Jesus as teacher, a sign of respect and authority. They say, uh, they say, we, notice how they refer to themselves as a group here, we know that you are true. You are upright and reliable, maybe. And furthermore, you are just and impartial. You don't fear men. You teach, truly teach, the way of God. The sarcasm, deceit, and irony of these words is unmistakable. They have come to trap Jesus. They don't believe a word of this. It's simply a ploy to try and lure their victim in. It's just wicked flattery. But yet it's all true. The irony here is is dark and vile. They are lying about the truth to the only one full of truth. They come to unjustly confront the very author of justice himself. They, are, they seek to trap and kill their only hope of salvation, and they are trying to deceive the only real way to the Father. But all this ironic flattery was meant to set Jesus up for a question, and it was a very good question, and it was a serious one. That Next, I want to unpack here and look at the serious, the, the serious question in verse 14. And this is a very particular question. Uh, these guys didn't, you know, make this up on the fly. No, this question had been well crafted from the top. The religious, the religious leaders have strategically crafted this question in an attempt to pin Jesus to the wall. They had the perfect question, so they thought. It was a heads you lose, tails you lose sort of question. Have you ever been asked one of those questions or ever have you ever asked one of those questions and a husband's how about when your wife comes out of the room well dressed up and ask you babe do you recognize anything different about me you're done right if you say no which obviously you haven't noticed you're in trouble if you try and guess and you get it wrong you're in deeper trouble It's a lose-lose type of question. Now, in a similar but obviously a much more serious way, this is that type of question here. It's It's a good question. It's a difficult question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or not? Now, I want to be crystal clear from the outset. This is not Uh, some kind of modern sounding question regarding the size of government and paying taxes to the IRS. Well, this question is thousands of times more loaded than that. The the tax being referred to is is the Roman poll tax that every adult male had to pay. It was done using the one, this one denarius coin. And by this tax, the Romans were able to keep track of the empire and fund their military, which in fact held sway over Jerusalem. So this tax literally funded the subjugation of the Jews. It was hateful to them. They detested it. Its payment was a constant reminder of Romans of Rome's rule over them. The coin itself collected for the tax was stamped with the inscription stating that Caesar was Lord. It read Tiberius Caesar Augustus son of the divine Augustus. On the flip side, on the reverse side, the title Pontifex Maximus meaning the high priest. The the Jews hated this coin. They hated this tax. Paying it was the Romans' way of making them confess, Caesar is Lord and Rome is your master. The historian Josephus records the violent uprising by the Jewish people in 6 AD when this very tax was instituted. And he tells us again of another revolt, similar response in AD 66 due to this tax. This in, there, there's no other way to really say it here. The Jews hated it. The Jews despised it. It was a continual reminder of their subjugation to the Romans. So 
we, we see just how serious this question is. By it, the Pharisees and Herodians are trying to expose Jesus as either a false Messiah to the Jews or a dangerous revolutionist to the Romans. So to say yes would be to agree with the Romans' unjust rule. It would expose Jesus as a Messiah with no intent to deliver his people from the Romans, so they thought. But to say no would be to defy Caesar and be subject to the strong hand of Rome. They had presented the ultimate lose-lose question for Jesus. No matter how he answers, he will alienate someone and be wrong. The question is intended to force Jesus to choose between the Romans and the Jewish people. And if he picks either, his mission is over. He will either forfeit his popularity with the people or forfeit his life to Rome. This was a serious question. It was a profound question but not nearly as profound as Jesus' answer where we will spend the rest of our time this morning. So I want to come next to what I call the, the revolutionary response here in verses 15 through 17. Now, Jesus saw right through their, their flattery and the intent of their question. In verse 15, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Now this word, Test or tempted is the same word found in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, referring to Satan testing or tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus understands their aim in presenting this question. He knows there is a vile, satanic attempt, an intent behind this question. These religious leaders are not just trying to publicly shame Jesus. They're trying to destroy him. They want him dead because they want his mission ended. So you see, this is not just a question regarding the state of taxes in Rome. This is a a loaded question meant to divert the Son of God from his divine mission in line with Satan's attempt in the wilderness. Jesus had a mission. We've seen that all through the Gospel of Mark. We see that all through the New Testament. And Jesus' mission carried both religious and political ramifications, just not the way these guys understood it. Jesus came to institute a new kingdom and to establish, create, gather a new people. We must not forget the words of Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So Jesus now proceeds to ask these guys a question to their question. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. He orders them to bring him the very coin which is required for this tax. You can just imagine people getting closer and starting to huddle around in anticipation. How will he answer this question? What will he say? Verse 16, and they brought one. Ironically, Jesus doesn't have one, but they do. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. As we already mentioned, each coin was stamped with a bust of Tiberius Caesar, assigning him status of divinity and ruler of the people. And then Jesus says these famous words, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, I know this may be one of the most familiar statements ever spoken by Jesus. It's it's right up there with love thy neighbor as thyself. And I think because of this, we tend to miss just how revolutionary this statement was and really miss its radical impact in the moment and on western civilization going forward this group could have never imagined this answer coming from jesus by this statement jesus does the unexpected he both acknowledges at the same time the legitimacy of a pagan government while demanding primary allegiance to god alone And this brings us back to, as where I began, Augustine's two-city argument. As the Christians, as Christians, we are simultaneously citizens of two cities. So how do we think about this? So really embedded, I think, in this statement are two truths we must grab hold to this morning to help us think about it. And the first one is this, that as Christians, we are to be good citizens in this world. Jesus commands that what belongs to Caesar 
ought to be given or paid to Caesar. In this case, taxes. Now, at first glance, this may not seem all that revolutionary to us, but we must not forget the context. Again, Jesus, as a Jewish man, just okayed a tax to Rome, the Jews' oppressors. And it's a tax which, uh, which, which in fact is used to strengthen their military, which upholds their oppression. And even worse, this is to be done through an idolatrous coin stating Caesar is Lord. The people would have been shocked by this. So this is more than a a clever answer by Jesus to get out of a so-called conundrum. There's no Capitol Hill briefing going on here. Jesus is not avoiding the question with his own question. He actually, with this question and with this response, provides something, I believe, of a theology regarding government and the Christian faith. We must not disconnect this statement from the previous parable we studied last week, which concluded with Jesus prophesying the destruction of his vineyard, Israel, in its current state, and the institution of the church, the new spiritual temple. So Jesus here provides what I believe to be a paradigm of sorts on how we, the church of Jesus Christ, are to understand our place in this fallen world as we execute his mission on this earth. Now, every state in history up to this point was built upon a claim to supernatural authority, be it the nation of Israel or pagan Rome. In other words, to live under any government up until this point meant to believe and embrace their God. To, you, you either bowed to their God or you revolted. There was no other option, which is exactly why they present this question as they do. This is exactly the tension that was existed between the Jews and the Romans. So what Jesus is saying here is unthinkable. It is revolutionary. Jesus here legitimizes a pagan government, even one that is oppressive and cruel. Jesus is no anarchist. Jesus is no revolutionary zealot. He says, give to Caesar what's due him. Pay taxes. Obey the governing authorities over you in every way you can. This is a shocking thing for Jesus to say. But we know, if we know our Bibles, we know that God has ordained authority in our lives. He has ordained the family. He has ordained the church. And he has ordained the government. And the rest of the New Testament affirms and expounds on this. In the most lengthy passage on human government, In Romans chapter 13, Paul says these words, and I'm going to read them in full to you, verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. God legitimizes government. It's his plan. Government is a good thing, even though they don't always act good. Almost any government is better than anarchy. Look, the the Roman government was oppressive and cruel. Paul writes under the tyrannical Emperor Nero, history says, took Paul's very life when he writes these words in Roman. But as cruel as Rome was, it was still fulfilling the role assigned by God to bring order and some measure of justice. Governments are instituted by God to do this very thing. That's why we read in 1 Timothy 2 that, for first of all, I Then I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high places, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. So as Christians, we have real responsibilities to government. We are to pay taxes. 
Christians should not cheat on their taxes. We are to pray for our leaders. No matter our political disagreements, we should not disrespect our leaders. While we can and should disagree with them in a healthy way, we do not slander or despise them by mouth or by Facebook post. We are to honor and obey our government in any way we can. We are to give to Caesar what is Caesar. And I just want to take a moment here and say to you, in light of this reality of God's authority over our life, that if you work for our government, maybe you're a police officer, a fireman, a government official, or you serve in one of the branches of our military, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for fulfilling the role God has assigned to you to uphold, to uphold order and extend justice in our nation. But I want to remind you that the authority you have been invested does not ultimately come from your boss, from our governor, or any ruling political body. It comes from God. Your responsibility is to wield that authority with justice as unto the Lord. Now, maybe you're wondering, Pastor Jimmy, are you saying that the Bible calls for us to give unqualified obedience to our government? I'm not. There are limits upon all authority outside of God. There are limits upon the authority of the state for sure. Civil disobedience is right when the government either prohibits us from doing what the Bible clearly commands or when it commands us to do what the Bible clearly prohibits. And we find warrant for this in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 when the governing authorities arrested the disciples and ordered them not to preach about Jesus, a clear command in the Bible. The disciples, of course, could not obey such a command, and their explanation was straightforward. We must obey God rather than men. Christians are never called to violate a command of God in obedience to the state. When man's law is in conflict with God's law, the right and proper thing to do is disobey. Now, an example much more closer to home, and one of my favorite, is found in a very, very important letter written by Dr. Martin Luther King from a Birmingham prison in 1963. Due to his civil disobedience, Dr. King found himself again arrested for protesting. But this time, there was a, a charge being leveled against him regarding the justice of his disobedience by many white pastors. And they wrote an open letter airing their grievances entitled, A Call of Unity. And in response, Dr. King justifies his action writing this famous letter from a prison cell in Birmingham where he says these words. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, at first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well say, how can you advocate breaking, advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just laws and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. And an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with God's law, the moral law. The segregation laws of our nation's past stood in direct confrontation with God's law, stating clearly that all people were made in the image of God. God assigns E equality, dignity, and worth, not man. Therefore, obeying man's law forced people to break God's law. Therefore, the law was unjust, immoral. Therefore, it was right and good for king to disobey. But even still, we 
in light of God's authority setting it over us, we should be very careful. And I think uh, very discerning and very careful about overthrowing power in some revolutionary way as the people of God, as Dr. King so faithfully demonstrated. Our Savior was no zealot, and neither should we. We should exhaust all resources, options, and legal channels before we choose to disobey. And we have to be willing to suffer consequences for breaking the law of man. The apostles were arrested and tortured, as was Dr. King, before change would come. But Jesus says more than just render to Caesar that which is Caesar. He also said, very importantly, render to God the things that are God's. So we have a duty to be good Christian citizens in this world. But we have an even greater obligation to uphold allegiance to our true king, Jesus Christ. So while we are good citizens on this earth, we must live as fully devoted citizens of Christ's kingdom. Now, refusing to be trapped by the either or agenda, Jesus provides this third way in the most astonishing fashion. If the coin has Caesar's image on it, then it belongs to him. Therefore, give him what's owed him. Yet we, as human beings, bear a different image. We bear God's very image. Each one of us are marked by the image of God, and so we are, we are to give to God what is rightfully His, our very lives, our true allegiance and worship. Now, by this statement, Jesus makes clear there's only one true God, and it's not Caesar. We have a, a duty to the government to live as good citizens. We have a command to give full allegiance to God alone. He alone is worthy of our worship, not any government. Governments play an important role, but governments are not eternal. God alone is eternal, and we bear His image and therefore are required to give Him His due allegiance. Friends, the Bible is crystal clear. We're all made in the image of God. We all bear His mark. He created us all. And we are all fallen and guilty before him. And we will all have to ultimately give an account, not to any human government, not to the United States of America, whatever country you are from. We will all have to give an account to him, everyone. Whether you say you believe in God or not, you will on that day when you stand before him. We all have to give an account to the one true God who created us and the one true God possessing the right to judge us. And Christianity alone offers a sufficient answer to the question, how will you give an account on that day? If you're honest, you know there are things in your life you must answer for. You have not always done what is right. And there's a God you must answer to. The God who created you, he's the one who's perfectly right. He's holy and just in every way. He's perfectly true, perfectly loving, perfectly holy, perfectly trustworthy. It's him we have to give an account to. It's been said that all religions do lead to God in the sense they all empty out at his judgment seat. The real question is, what answer will they provide you on that day? There's only one religion that has a Savior. There's only one religion with the good news of the gospel. And Jesus Christ is the Savior we all need. And this is exactly why Jesus came. The King himself came to live a life that we should have lived. Never sinning, but then to die a death that we deserve on our behalf for our sins so that we might receive his forgiveness and eternal life. And he rose again, demonstrating that it's, he's the true king of his eternal kingdom and that he grants access to all who will enter by faith in him and him alone. And brothers and sisters, 
If that's you today, you don't know Christ, you access to his kingdom comes through Christ, through faith in him, through repentance and a trust in him, making him king and Lord of your life. Jesus came to institute a new kingdom as a new king whom full allegiance is due. This is where I want to speak directly here. And I, there's, this is why I see the danger and the reason why we need to be very careful about referring to any nation as a Christian nation. America is not a Christian nation. Did the principles of Christianity influence the founding of our nation? Yes. Were some of the founding fathers, though fewer than we tend to think and read about, were they, some of them, truly believers? Probably so, yes. Has our legislation recognized the influence of our Christian heritage in making laws? Yes. However, that does not mean that most people in America are Christians or that a truly Christian worldview dominates our culture. While we are to be good citizens of the United States, our true citizenship and the purpose of our mission is not bound up with the United States of America. It's not this city. It's another greater city. Look, within healthy Christianity, there is a place for love of country. There is a place for proper patriotism. There's a place for honoring our nation's history and current moment. There's a place for Christians to labor faithfully within our government and institutions. All can be acceptable and good. We are to be good citizens. So please don't hear me say anything less than that this morning. But I want you to hear also, there is a line which is often crossed, and we need to be very careful. I even experienced that this week while preparing this message. I received an email asking if I would like to join our church into a larger prayer group for our nation in light of this pandemic from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, this is a great verse in the Bible, still applicable to us today. But there is a specific context to this promise in the Old Testament. It was given to Israel in a specific moment in redemptive history. For us to take out Israel and insert America in this passage, that he will heal our land, that's a promise. That is at best confusing, at worst a distortion of the kingdom of God. There are no promises like that for any nation state today. Now it's true, we should repent. And it's true, God may decide to bless our land if we do. But the particular nature of that passage has nothing to do with America or any other nation state today. I just want to ask you a question. Just consider for a moment. What does that say to our international brothers and sisters around the world? Are they to pray this for their country as well? Does the same promises that were related to Israel Pull out America and insert any other nation in there? Is that how it works? Or do we also, I think, tend to say, not directly but indirectly, that brothers and sisters around the world must come to America to receive such blessings and promises of God? Brothers and sisters, we are called to be good citizens on this earth. But if our citizenship on this earth detracts us, pulls us back, from our full devotion to Christ and his kingdom, we need to repent and refocus. Our citizenship in this city should produce a longing in us for another city. Hebrews 11, we find a 
list of believers gone before us who all lived by faith set as an example for us. And in verses 13 through 16 of Hebrews chapter 11, we're given this summary and this reasoning for their faith. These all died in faith, having not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and, and exiles on this earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, They would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared them a city. We are strangers. We are exiles in this country. This is not our home. We are temporary citizens passing through. Our promises rest on a far better city. We must keep this in perspective. And the application for this sermon needs to go in my heart and in your heart in a myriad of ways. But I I just want to challenge you this morning just to consider. If your approval or disapproval of a political party is more of what you're known for than the gospel of Jesus Christ, there may be a problem. If the bumper stickers on the back of your car identify you more with a political party than King Jesus, there may be a problem. We need to come back to understand what's being taught here. Look, because I want to be clear. There is a good place for patriotism. My dad, served our country faithfully in Vietnam as a 18 year old young man. And he came home with effects of the war that lasted his entire life until two years ago he took his very life because of it. So I understand the importance of honoring our troops and our country. My family knows that. But I know my hope for my father and my life and your life does not rest upon this country. We serve a far better king with a far better country. As one author says, Independence Day for the Christian is not 4th of July. It's not marked by a flag. Our Independence Day is Easter. It's marked by a cross and an empty tomb. So this statement by Jesus is truly revolutionary. With this statement, Jesus brought clarity to us as the people of God, as to how we are to live our lives on this earth while we labor for him. We must give government its rightful place. We honor. We submit where we can. We recognize the goodness in government over our lives by submitting and obeying the authorities over our lives. But our worship is do God alone. We belong to King Jesus, not any state, not any ruler, not any nation. And we labor as the church of Jesus Christ in currently with a zip code in this city for that city which is to come. As the church of Jesus Christ, we're called to be good citizens on this earth while giving full allegiance to King Jesus alone. So church, maybe as we finish this sermon, uh, a simple question you might want to put down in your notes and consider it more is, what is it in my life? Maybe we can think about it in terms of government and politics, but maybe it's broader than that. What is it in my life that tends to draw me away from my full allegiance to King Jesus and living for him? What is it that's keeping me as I live in this city, 
to live for that city. Let's pray. Worship team, you guys can come back up as I pray. Father in heaven, we, hello, we thank you that our hope, our promises are fixed on a far better king, your son, our savior. That our citizenship is seated in a far better city. Your heavenly city, the kingdom of God. And Lord, I, I pray for us as a church, we, we have a duty to be good citizens for now in the United States, for us who live here. We should pay taxes. We should pray for our leaders. We should seek justice. We should live for the good of our neighborhood. Might it be said that if our church was not in this neighborhood, this would be a far worse neighborhood. We want to be good neighbors, faithful, to live as good citizens in this city. But we must do that. We're commanded to do that with full allegiance to you. So we don't want to confuse and conflate the city of man with the city of God. So where we're grateful for all the blessings that come to us as Americans, all the joys and the privileges that we get in our great nation, we know our hope's not found here. It's in a far better city, in a far better land, run by a far more faithful and sovereign king. And it's him we follow as a church. And Lord, let us live for you. Let us understand the, the great significance that we as the people of God, as the church of Jesus Christ, can bring into the city of man a picture, a foretaste of the city of God. We do that by living as God's people. And we most assuredly do that by preaching our king. So Lord, remind us again where we need to fully commit our lives, pledge our allegiance to you again. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name. Amen. And as we uh, close our uh, with this song, uh, we're going to sing, In all my sorrows and all my victories, more than any comfort, more than all riches, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. And so this morning, let's make that our prayer that God will help our hearts to align with what our minds already know, that Jesus is Lord of all and that he is better than anything this world can offer. So let's worship together.
Family, we enjoy singing with you and worshiping with you. We're so grateful that we get to even do it in this manner. And um, if you're new to the Hill, maybe you're checking us in online. You've never been in our building with us. We're grateful that you're following us uh, online this way. We would love to though connect with you more directly. So on our website, under our Sunday rhythms, we have a, a connect uh, spot there, a, a button that you can click on and fill out a form that will give us your information and a any way that you can connect with us. And we would love to just tell, who, who, tell you who, who we are more as a church, how we can better serve you as a church even in this season. For those of you who call the Hill family, uh, I want to call you to our time of worship here where we give as a church. So I would invite you to continue doing that online. You can do it online through our website or you can still obviously mail in your offering to the church as well. We love you. We say that every week. And we're grateful to, uh, to be able to worship with you and look forward to being able to see you again face to face. So I'm going to close out our time, pray for our offering, and, uh, and, and close out our, our, our Sunday. Jesus, you are better. And there's nothing in really in life that we can say that unqualified statement about. You and you alone. You're better. No matter what we put alongside you, you're heavier. You're weightier. You're more glorious. You're more loving. You're more true. You're more gracious. You're more kind. 
We thank you for what we know of you in the gospel. Thank you for your life. We thank you for your death. We thank you for your enduring ministry now on our behalf, interceding, keeping us by your spirit, preparing us for the day when we'll see you face to face. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for our time today. Ask that you would take the words of my mouth as they reflect from your eternal words, seep them in our heart and grow our affections for you. Jesus, we're grateful. We ask you to bless the offering. Thank you for those who have been giving sacrificially. We're honored as a church. and We want to continue to use it, even as we said today, use every fund that comes in to advance the city of our King while we're here on this city of man. So Lord, we love you. Thank you. And we end our time in Jesus' name. Amen.